All right. All well, right. welcome. It's uh, Friday the 10th of December 2022 and we're really getting, have got through a whole lot of Black History Conversations. I'm Liz Millman from Learning Links International and we're supported by a whole range of colleagues here who are delighted to be welcoming Dr Christine White and Dr Richard Anderson who are currently undertaking research in South Africa. So we're just going to uh, introduce the session properly. I'm in Australia and so I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently living, the Wanjiri people of the Kulin Nation, their elders past, present and future, as this land belongs to the sovereign people of the First Nations and was never ceded. It always was and always will be. Um, Aboriginal land. And just to remind us as well that it's the international decade for people of African descent. So really interesting that we've got uh, researchers uh, today. Um, hello, I can see both of you now. This is just wonderful. So that's really, really great. Okay, last week we had a great session, just to let you know, we had um, Dr. Bunmi Oisan, and she was talking about uh, um, why are Africans mourning for Queen Elizabeth II and uh, we had a really good discussion so that was fine. Okay then right so I'm going to uh, wrap that up just a while and uh, get back into um, greeting all of you so it's really lovely so it's great Richard and Christine that you're able to join us and so I know how fragile the link is. Kwaku um, we're going to introduce ourselves later but we're just going to get on with this while we've got the connectivity sorted so what are you drinking there Richard <laughs> wonderful right let's let's hear you okay all right greetings to you very there we are <laughs> oh, right. proof, proof that it's Rui boss is it wonderful <laughs> Richard, it's wonderful to greet you, and Christine, it's lovely that you're there as well in South Africa together. You're just going to have to tell us all about it, what this is all about. Great. Yeah, well, I think we'll begin. I have a PowerPoint to share, so let's see if I can share screen, and we'll see if that works. Uh, now, Liz, does that work for you? Can you see me yeah. and can you see the slides? I can see the slides beautifully. The Cape Colony. Great. That's where there you are. we are. This You're is where we are. And uh, we come here, uh, obviously, as Africanists, but uh, not historians of this particular region of the continent. Uh, we mainly write about West Africa, Sierra Leone in particular, which is where we met at a conference a decade ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is our first time in the archives and say uh, in the Cape and um, kind of so you can see that this is very much preliminary in kind of what we've been pulling together since being here. Um, but kind of the underlying logic and reasons for being here comes from a quote from uh, Nigel Warden, who's a historian based at the University of Cape Town. And he says that in the extensive comparative literature on slavery and emancipation, the Cape Colony receives little attention. Um, and so really what we're looking at is we want to look at how the history of the Cape not just fits, but really speaks to a lot of the themes that we look at in Black history conversations, especially because it sort of exists in this interesting space on the one hand, facing the Atlantic, but also having strong connections to the Indian Ocean. Um, so I'm sure that many of you are familiar broadly with the history of the Cape in the region. Um, a lot of focus is, of course, on the history of the 20th century um, and sort of South Africa's incredible history, um, especially in the 1990s, where historians primarily of the 19th century and earlier periods. And so really what we're looking at here is a period of history that begins and even precedes the Dutch in the 1650s um, through the era of colonial emancipation in the 1830s. Um, so looking primarily at British records, also of course the records of VOC or the Dutch East India Company, um, there's always a barrier in terms of language and that neither of us speak or read Dutch, um, but just considering that this is a sort of very significant history um, related to the history of the Atlantic. Um, and one thing that becomes very clear is that the Cape Colony from the outset is a slave society. Um, the first governor, uh, 
Jan van Riedbeck uh, brings household enslaved people when he comes to Table Bay and claims it for the Dutch in 1652. And it remains so through British abolition in 1834. And again, the period in between when it goes from being a Dutch colonial claimed possession to being a British colony in the late 18th century. Um, and it's often a place that's known as a settler society, again, like, like, like Canada, like Australia, as being a dominion within the British Empire, the Dutch Empire before that, as a place of settlement. Um, but we know that throughout the, the 18th century, enslaved people far outnumber the number of settlers. Um, and in Cape Town especially, most enslaved people were owned by the VOC. Um, and they were housed in a barrack-like building that's known as the Lodge, is the point that we'll return to as it is today a museum. And so we are both historians of the African diaspora, so we're interested in the history of where people came from, um, how they forged societies under amazing duress. You know, I think for us, some of the most amazing places that we visit, places like New Orleans are places that have a very tragic history, but something where something miraculous emerges out of that history because it inadvertently brings people from so many places. And there's an interesting story in terms of the Cape where in terms of the slave trade, we know that people arrive from West Central Africa, that is Angola, also from the East African mainland and from Madagascar, that is in East Africa and the Indian Ocean. Um, but these are also outnumbered, especially in the period of the Dutch East India Company by people from South Asia, India and Ceylon, and Southeast Asia of Indonesia. So when we look at the history of the 20th century, when the apartheid government tries to categorize and parse people based on backgrounds, those that they define as Cape colored were often people who had been here for centuries, um, the product of some of these forced migrations from parts of Africa, but also from South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, of course, we know that wherever um, this history is, exists, there is always different forms of resistance. And one key element we're looking at is this sort of question of resistance within the Cape um, and beyond. Um, And so we know that there is evidence of people resisting from the very early history of the colony, even if we don't see large scale rebellions the way that you'd see in Jamaica, for example. Um, we know as early as 1655, that is three years after the founding of the colony, a man named Anthony of Madagascar runs away and he's never heard from again. And we see that especially forms of running away become more pronounced as colonial society, different forms of labor demands developed from the 15th, uh, rather the 17th of the 19th century. Um, now we know that most people who run away remain within the colony or in close proximity. They often rely on people who are residing in the city. And so they'll reside, for example, in the surrounding mountain ranges. So one thing to consider is that this is a place that's very much framed and identified by Table Mountain. But you can imagine in the 17th, 18th, 19th century of runaway people who would flee and Table Mountain being known as a type of refuge and people in Cape Town being to look, able to look up at night and seeing the fires being lit on the mountain from people who had fled to seek Cape, Table Mountain as a type of refuge. Um, so explain to us, what would this what would this letter be written in? What is the language? Yeah, so this is a really fascinating letter. And again, uh, there's a system where we have to get images from the archive. And so we're hoping to have more, but this is an example of one really fascinating document in the Western Cape archives, which are about two blocks from here. Now, this is a language that I know nothing about. Uh, it's a language of Indonesia named Bugis, B-U-G-I-S. Um, we know this is written, or it, it was found in the possession of a, a man you can see at the bottom, September Van Boogies in 1760. Uh, you can probably get a sense that this is not his original name, his name of birth. Um, he's an enslaved person. Dutch authorities find this letter in his possession. They translate it via Malay into Dutch. And what they conclude is that this person, this man, September, is 
assisting people who have fled. He's providing them with food, tobacco, ammunition. And so what you can see is that there's a sort of type of underground network of, of solidarity among people who have been brought to the Cape against their will from what is today Indonesia. So it's an example of how a lot of people who fled didn't move far away. It was often in the proximity of Cape Town or to farms where they had left from. Um, but we also have some really interesting examples of, of long distance escapes that is often of people much like in the Caribbean where you'd find a passing ship at Port Royal or some other port. Um, we see many instances of that in terms of Table Bay. Um, we actually found a really interesting case where people who are imprisoned in the 750s on, on Robben Island are able to capture a passing boat and get from Robben Island, obviously famous in the 20th century, but in the 750s, 1750s are able to get from Robben Island to Madagascar and then to Batavia. So they're able to take a tremendous voyage simply by taking a ship. And so that kind of brings me to the reason that I, I'm, oh, what's wrong? Sorry, PowerPoint's frozen, let's see. <laughs> the reason that I'm um, here doing research in Cape Town is to do with my project, which is about um, what happens to children who are liberated from ships after 1807 um, and the abolition of the- Are you drinking the devil's advocate? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, this is the Rue Boys, oh, yeah. The Rue Boys. <laughs> um, and, the Cape Colony is one of the places to which um, liberated children were brought and resettled. But unlike Sierra Leone, which is where the majority of them were brought, this wasn't a sort of planned settlement. Instead, they were brought into this, as Richard described, the slave society where there's Dutch and English settlers um, who have relied on both South Asian, Southeast Asian, and African enslaved labor for a long time. And so when people are liberated and in inverted commas into the Cape Colony, there's numerous instances of abuse and exploitation of their, their labor. And so, for example, one of the first um, young boys to be liberated um, into the Cape Colony, present than Mozambique. After being in the colony for 18 years, he comes to the, what's a position called the guardian of slaves. This is a person who is appointed to hear the complaints of enslaved people and the kind of run up to the abolition of slavery in the British empire. And he complains that he's been illegally detained. And um, he arrived in the Cape Colony in 1808. And he only came to the realization that um, he'd been trafficked illegally when he met in 1826 with two other boys who had been on the same ship as him, two boys named April and July. And April and July told President um, that they were now free. And so he realized, well, I have also been um, illegally trafficked into slavery in Cape Colony. And he came to the Guardian of Slaves to claim his, his freedom. And so the, the records from the Cape Colony show when a number of these types of cases of different forms of exploitation um, of one of the people who are called prize apprentices, people who'd been or should have been liberated from, from slavery. Another interesting case is a man called Jean Elay, who is liberated in 1810 from a French ship called um, the Racehorse in the Indian Ocean. And he is the son of a uh, French plantation owner in Mauritius and an enslaved African woman. And when he's on board Le Victor, Le Victor when it's captured by the racehorse, um, the British crew assume that everyone, every person of color on board is enslaved. Um, and so take them to be liberated in the Cape Colony. But Jean Allais says that he was never enslaved. He was born free, his father's a French planter, and they, he's a free man um, and not enslaved. And in fact, he calls himself a prisoner of war because he sees it as um, an act of aggression by the British against the French, and that he's been captured as part of this battle. But he is processed legally as though he were a liberated enslaved person. 
and because of that is indentured for 14 years in the Cape Colony, um, where he works as a cook, um, and then sort of close to the end of his indentures, after 13 and a half years of forced labour in the Cape Colony as a result of this, this capture by the British ship, his, um, his apprentice master dies and the control, collector of customs at the time tries to transfer him into his own employ because he knows of him as a really good cook um, and so he wants him to join his household. And he also makes a com complaint about this saying, but in this case, he's saying not even that he was a liberated African or a prize apprentice, but in fact, he had never been enslaved and had just been simply scooped up by the British um, as part of their uh, this kind of aggressive actions against the French. Yeah, so I'll show, I can show a map here. Again, so if we both come to this from studying these populations of so-called liberated Africans in the Atlantic, and so we'd have some the estimates here in terms of the Cape significance of being a place where, especially in the 1810s and again in the late 1830s and into the 1840s, where probably somewhere between five and 6,000 people are brought off captured slave ships. And it's sort of a question of what we can know about their lives, especially as many serve apprenticeships up to 14 years. This is either in Cape Town or in farms and wineries of the Eastern Cape. <clears throat> and then again, how this relationship, how this, sort of, how this history of what 1807 meant or didn't mean in different parts of the Atlantic. And of course that goes as well for um, the emancipation of, uh, or rather the abolition of slavery within the British Empire in the 1830s. And of course, we most often associate that with the history of the Caribbean, um, but those acts in terms of 1834, and then the end of the apprenticeship period in 1838, also applied to the Cape Colony as well. Uh, and there's a great image that we've seen in the last week and apologies for not having a color image is even more striking in color, um, which you can see is procession on the anniversary. So in the Cape Colony as with many other parts of the former British empire, whether it's Barbados or in Ontario, they celebrate the anniversary of Emancipation Day. Um, but of course, as we know, emancipation in the 1830s was something that was achieved by a, a massive package of compensation from the British government, not to the enslaved people, but rather to enslavers. Uh, and the Cape forms a part of this history as well. So we know that roughly 20 million pounds are given out to people who claim for the supposed loss uh, at the time of colonial abolition. Um, so 20 million pounds today uh, in, in the 1830s, maybe as much as 19 billion pounds today. Um, of that 20 million, roughly 1.2 million goes to the Cape. So it's not an insignificant part of this his broader history of, of abolition in the British Empire. Uh, and one thing to consider is looking at, all right, well, who does this compensation money go to? Um, and now I've given one example here. I mean, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with uh, the great database project, this University College London on the legacies of British slavery that looks at who benefited from this period of, of emancipation, who received compensation money. Um, and one example we saw and Liv looked at is a man named Andrew Murray. Now he was a Scottish minister and he was one of a number of Scottish ministers who were recruited to be ministers in the Dutch reformed church in the Cape Colony in the 1820s. Now, one thing you'll see here from his biography is that he is an alumnus of King's College Aberdeen where I now teach. Uh, it's also the case that in the 1830s, he receives more than 2,000 pounds compensation for, I believe, 59 enslaved people in the Cape Colony. Um, and so one thing we've been able to see this week is that he is somebody who goes out from Scotland, makes a career in South Africa. He sends his children to be educated at the University of Aberdeen. They also study theology in Holland. And then they come back and are also ministers and missionaries themselves. And so if you see, uh, we've been able to find a Dutch church in central Cape Town that has a memorial to his son. So this is somebody who's an alumnus of my university, but is also somebody whose father held enslaved people and benefited financially from the end of slavery in the British Empire. Um, in some ways, this is one of a number of monuments and memorials that we've looked at in our time here, which relates to 
very entangled question of memorials, mem memorialization, and, and in terms of sort of remembering and forgetting, um, sort of, I think a broader conversation that, that, that we're having at the moment. Uh, and I'll show two examples. The image at right is today a museum, and this is the, the slave lodge in central Cape Town. Um, the image at left is actually a statue that's immediately in front of where we're staying. And this is uh, a statue to Johan van Rijbeek, who is again, the first governor of the Dutch East India Company and begins this process. <laughs> so I got a bit of wind here. And perhaps sort of layers of interest here were actually uh, erected in 1899 um, and it's paid for by Cecil Rhodes. And so to consider that so much around statues and memory uh, in Britain within the empire is related around figures like Rhodes. It's interesting to consider that, well, in the late 19th century, Rhodes thought it fitting to erect a statue to a gov the first governor of the Dutch East India Company in the Cape Colony. So I think uh, we leave it there. Yeah, I okay. think so. <laughs> I think we're, good. we're definitely pushing it in terms of the Wi-Fi. Yeah, we got low Wi-Fi and higher winds, so we'll leave it there. It's... Well, I think that was absolutely magnificent. I'm just uh, just in awe of what you've you've uh, you've managed to uh, to share and, and include there, and and so important from Black History Conversations point of view because we've never done anything about South Africa and and any of the stories there. So this is a real uh, really important step along the road. So um, I don't know if we've got questions from anyone, first of all. I'm just trying to alter my view so I can see you all. Anybody coming up with a question at all? All right, well, um, my my point, I think, was that I was really interested about the, um, uh, the captured slave ships because after emancipation, no, after... Um, the stopping of the slave trade, then um, the British Navy became very active in capturing um, ships that had got enslaved people on them, and then they were they were um, they came then to to the Cape Colony. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and this is um, it happens in the very kind of early stages of abolition and then again in the 1840s and there's really great demand in the Cape Colony for the labor of these people um, and that demand increases after the abolition of slavery so I mean just today this morning looking at some some documents some petitions from farmers in the the Western Cape archives here there's a reference to, to someone who was pretty originally pretty reluctant to take um, liberated Africans on as laborers because they were in such a poor physical condition after these like horrific journeys that they'd suffered. But in later years, he becomes more enthusiastic about it and he becomes really um, keen to, to take on these laborers because they keep talking about the scarcity of labor but of course what they're actually talking about is the the abolition of of slavery and the resistance of people um of the indigenous communities here to work for them um and so there's i mean it's only today that we've had the chance to visit the archives so this is like very preliminary stuff but there's a lot of stuff that they are about from wine farmers from corn farmers um complaining to the government about the lack of labor and asking for solutions and and they're looking for child immigrants from from Europe um, but they also are making requests to divert liberated Africans to the Cape Colony so what we did earlier this week instead um, before going to the archives is we were meeting with the the academics at Stellenbosch University who are trying to digitize a lot of the archival material um, and have like a lot of different historical projects, South African history. Um, and they're doing some work on the compensation records and emancipation. Um, so we met with them in Stellenbosch earlier, earlier this week. So I thought, thought this project might be of interest to people. 
Yeah, this uh, project um, that I've just put up, the biography of an uncharted people, this is some, um, a link that you just put on the chat, Richard. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we met with them earlier this, this week. And so that's why we're only just in the archives <laughs> today. Right. Starting. Okay, so this is unchartedpeople.org. So anybody could look that up if they're, they're interested mm -hmm. to find out more on that and follow that on. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Garrick's got a, a point he wants to raise. Yes, um, Richard, um, thanks very much for your presentation and um, very interesting um, what you've presented. Um, I don't know exactly what the aim of your research um, will be ultimately, um, but clearly um, lots of, you know, good information. I'm thinking um, how we actually use this information. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know what sit behind your institution in back in, um, in Scotland, in, in Glasgow, um, in relation to um, uh, how this research will either address, um, you know, the current inequalities or goes towards um, feeding into the bigger reparation argument, uh, which is global. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, you know, um, what particular audience um, are we, you know, trying to, to reach um, with, with these conversations? Because I, I think sort of a strategic way in, you know, what, what can this piece of research accomplish um, uh, as far as, you know, addressing something, um, not just information, historic information. Um, but for me, it, it, it needs to be more than that. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking um, probably connecting with um, uh, David Arishola from Manchester University, uh, mm -hmm. the work he's doing, um, and 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 it, there's a bigger picture there that that need to be addressed. So um, you know maybe you could answer some of those. Yeah, I think you know part where a lot of what we look, you know, one thing was. There's many there's commentators of certain political persuasions when you begin talking about um, reparations, when you start talking about the legacies of slavery in the present, often the first thing they'll say is, what about abolition? Yes, but we abolished it and we abolished it a long time ago. And I think what we do in the terms of our work is like, what did that actually mean? What did that look like? So often this history of abolition is taken to be something that ends the conversation or is treated in a very triumphalist, moralist victory type of way, um, often with almost no regard for actually saying, well, what actually happens to people? What does it mean for people's lives? Hundreds of thousands of people's lives. Um, and so this is a continuation of a project where I primarily tried to answer that question in terms of Sierra Leone, but also looking in terms of, okay, history of the Cape, very significant part of the British empire. What does abolition actually mean? Is it a meaningful change in terms of people's lives? What does it mean to be liberated or freed in a colonial setting if you're being liberated or freed into the 19th century British Empire? And we've had a lot of um, attention now paid to the compensation money, thanks to the academics at, at UCL and the, the database. And one thing that's interesting about the Cape example is that these are people based in the Cape, they're receiving this money from the British government, they're receiving this British, and then they're in, investing it into the, the system of white supremacy here in the Cape colony, right? And so that's like one particular way in which compensation money is being used and, and spent. Um, and I think the other thing that was interesting was in meeting the team from Stellenbosch is thinking about ways that you could um, kind of actualize or operationalize or put in place reparations here in South Africa and ways that create pathways for black students and scholars um, 
to be doing research into this history is, I mean, largely the, the research that's been done so far, and there's not that, that much, has been um, done by a sort of very small handful of, of people, and it doesn't really connect well with local communities. It's all done in kind of broad kind of South African scale. And so there's definitely an opportunity to sort of rethink um, how the history is written in South Africa and who's who's writing it. And, but that involves creating pathways and funding for black students like through the master's program and PhD program and, and into, um, into jobs that can support and sustain that research. But I think that would also be an area to think about but in terms of reparations and what academic institutions in the UK could be doing um, to support that, that kind of work. Um, so I think that was something that came out really strongly in talking to people at Stellan Bosch was like how to how to create that sort of infrastructure support students um, through the system. I think it's fascinating, and I, I thank you both so much. Thank you for that point, Garrick. Um, yeah. Christine um, is at uh, the University of Glasgow, and she's spoken on previous earlier. Um, Black History Conversation, sharing the research that you're doing about the children who are brought to um, the UK and and their stories. And Richard, you're, is it Durham you're at? Richard? Pardon? Is it Durham Sorry. that you Yeah. Aberdeen. Sorry. It's all right. Close on you who's in the Northeast. So you're at Aberdeen University. And what's fascinating to me is I think, you know, that you're working with African um, academics. And it's always great when we get Professor Sati from Nigeria, um, from Joss University in Nigeria. It's great when we get these academic links, uh, hearing about the links around the world, so that we've just got a better, better understanding of the complexities of the history. Uh, so that um, we can really get an appreciation of um, just what the British and other Europeans were doing around the world and and also recognising, you know, the wonders of what was going on before British colonisation mm -hmm. and what's happened uh, subsequently. So, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Garrick, for that, that point. And, you know, it makes us focus again doesn't it i cannot believe that we've managed to, to have uh, connectivity for so long this is really wonderful <laughs> no 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 you've been having a bit of trouble there obviously in your yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. we're really sitting in a kind of cafe driveway right now um so that's why people keep speaking to us as they walk by everyone's like being really friendly and saying hi as they walk <laughs> it's really lovely so say hi to them from us uh, anyway, <laughs> so thank you so much i think you know we've we've taken a good chunk of your lunch break and uh, you need to be on with your research and we look forward to uh, in the new year, you know, when you want to come and join us again, please come and yeah. tell us. And thank you for your support over the time. It's been really so valuable, really very valuable. Thanks for such a lot. Oh, no. Thanks, thank Liz. Thanks so much. Well, oh, hang on. Thanks, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to turn the camera off because there's music in the street. But yeah, thanks, Gary. For that's a fantastic right. question. You're totally listening, are you? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, well, thanks, um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see, but We've got something interesting to follow this up with folks. So um, I've Great. just uh, realized that one of my colleagues is in, um, now where is he? Just a minute. Um, no, I've got the wrong thing there. So I've got to cross that out. Um, so there we've got, just going to get my Facebook page up. This will surprise you. Okay, so this is all on the theme of what's going on in, South Africa at the moment. I hope it's all right to share this. I've asked for permission and Bernard Burrell says, yes, it's fine to share. So Bernard has just flown into South Africa and uh, I, I'm not quite sure where he is. This sounds really awful, but anyway. So he, said, he, he posted all these super photographs of Christmas in, in South Africa. So we know as well as going to the museum, you know, work in your museums and, and the archives, then you'll be seeing uh, Christmas in, in Africa coming up. Isn't he gorgeous, that lion? So uh, is this all right, just seeing a few of these lovely photographs that Bernard uh, shared on Facebook? Quite sure that one. <laughs> Obviously getting ready to have a good time. It's winter time, uh, Christmas time, gorgeous fashions. 
Yeah, so he must be in Cape Town, I worked out from this, doing my research, looking at Facebook. <laughs> but he's also in the, the one of the cathedrals. This is where I think um, Desmond Tutu was uh, Archbishop, I think. And this is the, uh, you can't see the words on here, um, but this is the Black Madonna uh, reading on his Facebook. Yeah, the African Madonna carved in lignum whitey wood by Leon Underwood. Um, and that's interesting because lignum vitae is um, uh, a wood that's found in Jamaica. So it says it's interesting such purchases are normally housed in the Tate Gallery, London. So um, special thing there. And <laughs> loads of agapanthus, we've got heaps of those. So they're native in South Africa, so it's beautiful to see them there. We have loads of them in Australia, loads and loads of them in Australia because we have many. South African plants and they're considered a bit of a weed here. All right, so these are apparently, these are some of the posh apartments as he's taking photographs of. Finding your way around Cape Town, another clue to where Bernard Burrell is at the moment. I know he's not listening in, but you can watch this. And this is um, a sort of Afrikaner's sending Gestig Museum. And the first slave church in South Africa inaugurated in 1804. So that's an interesting uh, remnant as well. Right, another clue that is in Cape Town. <laughs> and there we are back at the beginning again with his uh, African uh, Christmas uh, um, story. So, uh, right, I'll stop sharing all of those. But I thought it was just just lovely that we'd got the uh, the links with the the African uh, South African uh, Facebook. Okay, Garrick. Um, that that photo you just showed of the slave church, um, uh, eighteen oh four, I think the date was. Um, was that built specifically um, for just slave people? Right, Garrick, this is research that you need to do because <laughs> I just literally picked those off Facebook about about an hour ago. Yeah, so what I was thinking, you know. Um, but yes, it would be so interesting because it, it's interesting. Why does it say it's a slave church? Yes, precisely, precisely. And I thought when I looked through the Facebook pictures, there was also one that came up that didn't come up then. I don't understand why. And I'm not going back trawling through, but it said about it being the church that had been Desmond Tutu's church. So we need to uh, maybe do a bit of research. We can mm. find out more about it. And and I mm. certainly think there's two two areas of the world that I I feel for my un better understanding of, of of history that we need to look at. And one is South Africa and the stories there and the Southern African countries. Um, and the other is Ireland. We have not had. We've had one colleague from Ireland talk about Ireland's links with black history. So these are all thoughts that I've got for, for the next uh, season. Jim, mm. you've come back on again. What did you think of that then, Jim? Well, South Africa, it's been a very excellent presentation, but South Africa is not without its problems and not, not since apartheid, but before that, uh, the Zulus, uh, have been a very strong race and they have uh, had their empire and taken over parts of Africa, large parts of Africa, that is uh, not part of South Africa anymore. They became Dutch colonies and uh, other colonies. Uh, but I think the history is important, history of divisions and disagreements. Uh, based on nobility, uh, class uh, in the old context, in the feudal context, not in the in the modern context. Uh, but what worried me a great deal is I marched 23 miles when I was at Oxford, from Oxford to Banbury, to collect money for ZANU PF and for an anti-apartheid movement. A good colleague of mine, a fellow trade unionist were locked up under the apartheid system. And so we raised a lot of money between 1970 and 1974 at great pains, but walking 23 miles is not a joke. So I've always had an interest in South, in Africa. 
because the number of exiles around politics in Oxford are waiting for the country to be liberated and they can go back and play their role. And But since then, it hasn't been great. You know, Mandela, one of the greatest men ever lived, I think, but his legacy has not been addressed. Zuma, totally corrupt. When I went to South Africa with a trade union delegation, I met Cyril Ramaphosa, and they adored him. Trade union background, excellent man. Uh, and we adored him. And anybody who could say Cyril Ramaphosa claimed to be a socialist could pronounce his name. Now, when the Mar Marika miners went on strike, it was a Zuma and Ramaphosa government that killed 45 and injured probably twice as many. And Ramaphosa now owned the mine. He doesn't a trade union official in Marika mine from Tiny Roland. He's now the owner in a consortium of the mine. So our trade union support shrunk. Although I tried in the trade union movement to say it's not uh, Ramaphosa or Zuma, and Ramaphosa cannot extract himself from the corruption of Zuma. He was the vice president. And so the union people have lost interest in South Africa as a whole. We're now turned towards Colombia, Venezuela, and other parts of the world. But that Marika Miner was a black officer, a woman, black African woman, minister of justice, sent in the troops and killed his four miners and didn't support this village, then and South Africa, I'm gonna finish with this sentence to say now they are no better than they were when Mandela came to power, economically, structurally, land ownership, wealth, health, housing, education. What they've deliberately have done, they've grown a black middle class who are now in power, and you can't recognize their policies from, from uh, Vavud or Bota or any other white uh, uh, colonialists and racists. And that must be disappointing because South Africa, one of the biggest country in Africa, the most powerful country, the leadership is not there. Uh, and as far as the final, final thing is, one good thing is, one good thing is that uh, many African countries haven't followed the West and condemn Russia. Russia has never known any African countries as a colony. And the West wants to blame Russia for all the evils in the world. And when they finish with Russia, they're going to have a go at China. And China is a new imperialism and turning Africans against these two nations. But many African countries are sensible. And the working class recognize historically what the liberation movement and the Bolshevik party have done under the USSR, under, I can't think of his name, um, this guy who drank Coca-Cola and eat hamburgers, and a friend of um, Yeltsin, a friend of uh, America, who would have uh, break up Russia into little colonies and give, uh, give the West control of uh, that. Um, but, you know, I'm disappointed. I have met and fought. I met Secretary. I, I, I wrote to Amica Gabriel. I met uh, Tanzania, Nereri. Uh, Tijan Kassim in Sierra Leone, all his friends I met at Oxford and I kept in touch with them. So I enjoy and I thank you, Liz, for keep putting this black thing on the agenda. Africa is our country, our motherland, and it's not a third world, it's the first world. Africans gone all over the world. China, India, Japan, all over the world. We're not third world, we're a first world country. It's only colonialism and imperialism that kept us poor, but our history didn't start with slavery. Our history is grand. We've got to teach our children and grandchildren about the greatness of Africa. But one thing is the disunity and wars and internal strife that gave the imperialists a hand in Africa because many of them sold their own people to the, to the slavers. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. And uh, we, uh, Garrick put a message in to say, yes, he concurs very much with you. And I'm so sure so many of us do. Jim, you, you are an absolute treasure because you, you are 
your your history, your research, the work you've done, the challenges that you've taken on, um, are just just remarkable and and great respect to you, Jim. Thank you. Um, and great respect as well, because we still have three hundred pounds in the bank from you. Thank you very much indeed. I want to top that up, Liz. I want to top that up. I want to see progress, and we're going to top it up. I'm not going to take it to the grave with me, my darling. We're all doing this because we are socialists. We are committed. We're anti-racist, anti-imperialist. I want Thank to build you. that website, help you to build it even more. And I don't okay. want to embarrass my colleagues because there are lots of people I know who have been in some of these sessions as wealthier than I am. So I'm going to say, comrades, solidarity, put your hands in the pocket. This site's not going to only help the Welsh people and the Jamaicans. It's going to help everyone who's interested in justice, freedom. So please, my colleague, I've no professors about, and you know, they, 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 they've got lots of power and status, but spare a bit of cash for this project. We've got to get this website built. We've got to use it as a national, international resource. And I think it's possible. Yeah. Okay, Jim. So where we're at at the moment, we've identified um, a web site designer who's going to help us and work with us learning links has put uh, another hundred pounds in i'm afraid we're not particularly flush at the moment um and if you're willing to make another contribution that's yes. anybody else who wants to chip in that would be lovely so we hope that then by the new year by season eight that we will have the website up and running and have structured it in a way that people can use it to learn about black history themselves because um really all of us have to educate ourselves we can't be relying on being educated about black history and there's so many different strands that people can take an interest in and 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 follow through so long as you've got a basic sort of timeline and a basic understanding there's all sorts of things that can explore so thank you very much indeed jim that's absolutely brilliant. i'm going to go now liz i want to go to the loo it takes me a long time to get there <laughs> okay off you go then jim Thanks. that's brilliant thank you very much indeed for your support anyway um richard i know that uh, you're still there with christine and and the greatest thanks to you for the contributions that you've made. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, we've just got a, a really good crowd. So um, I'm just going to look and see where I was at with um, with my PowerPoint from last week, because we got halfway through and didn't get a lot further. So I'm just going to share this with you now, just a bit more further information, and then we'll we'll wrap up the recording because it's been a really, really great session this has. Okay then, so where am I? Share the screen, here we are. So just to remember that we had um, Bunmi Oisan speaking last week. Um, Bunmi's um, uh, uh, also a, a well-known author. So as part from the Sankova Pan-African series, which is a fantastic initiative that um, uh, Bunmi um, took, um, has created since um, 2020, she started it uh, at the same time as we did. Um, and she's got so many different recordings. She's also, as you can see, an author with her two books two books, new releases, Twisted Minds and Three Women. Um, and the reason that I just wanted to go back to the theme that we were talking about last week, which is about the British royal family. And it is interesting. We've been comments today about, you know, the fact that the British royal family would cream off funds that um, were paid for, for all sorts of things. So, um, these, this was just something that came up in September around about, well, at the time of the Queen's death when some areas started talking about um, cutting ties with the, the British monarchy and in renewing calls for, for reparations. So um, this is, this is an interesting article from Democracy Now! and a further article from Democracy Now! was from um, uh, this good gentleman, Makomo Wanongi, um, from Cornell University. And his um, article, again, in Democracy Now! Um, 
looks at Britain's death prompting reckoning in the colonial past in Africa. And you only have to remember the and have colleagues from South Africa to be talking about the colonial past. It's um, and when you hear about the dates being so so recent and and hearing Jim talk about um, the the campaigns during apartheid, I can remember campaigning uh, after Steve Biko's death. And yes, all those things we need to uh, to be more informed about and remember. Um, okay, uh, I won't go through any of the other parts of the PowerPoint. I think we've covered some of those last week and and before. So. It's a case really of keeping your eyes open to see what information is about and um, what's uh, what's useful. And, and in a moment, we're just going to talk about a really interesting link and something, Sharon, that you talked about uh, and about an excellent new book by Hakim Adi. So, uh, Gorit, you go next. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I attended the um, Sankova session on Monday um, and that was well attended Liz 289 uh, participant um, yeah. and um, you know very very uh, informative I've connected uh, with um, three of those um, speakers through LinkedIn and uh, we're having further conversation um, and I think um, you know that that whole series of of um, uh, Bundy is really um, you know so important. Trying to get that globally, um, you know, just just to get it out there as widely as possible. Um, and I think you know um, people appreciate the work she's doing um, in in uh, um, you know getting uh, information. Um, you know, online, because that, that's a thing, so that people have access to the information. Um, and, you know, uh, we just need to continue pushing that information out. I think that's an excellent point. I'm so glad you were able to join. Um, I just couldn't stay awake. You know, I'm in Australia and it was some four o'clock in the morning or something. I just couldn't couldn't make that but I'm so glad that you took part in that and that's absolutely fantastic I've not got the PowerPoint to give the detail about that conference but I'll perhaps remind people again um, next week so I'm hoping that we're going to hear there's a recording of it that would be really brilliant um, but one of the things that's interesting Eric is that Bunmi has at times used Black History Conversations as a feed for interesting speakers so I'm not sure if Richard or Christine um, you've been invited to talk on Bummy's sessions but they're really interesting I know David Alston has um, and and different ones I can't remember Simon whether you've done it or not but um, yes it's really interesting to share so I'm just going to thanks for that Gary that's absolutely brilliant really timely um, Sharon you were talking Sharon's got Ella Dizzy up here on her name tag but she's um uh, interesting she's she's uh, joined us uh, a couple of times in the past and she was uh, talking to me about an excellent new book by hakin adi now if i can find hakin adi's site which i just had up here a minute ago here we are right okay um so uh back into the uh, share the screen mode again Somebody's put a chat in, I haven't read it yet. Um, okay, so Hakim Adi is um, at a university in the south of England. I can't remember where you said, Sharon. Chichester. 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 Lovely, thank you. And uh, presumably, um, well, let's read what his big quote is from uh, Frederick Douglass. If there's no struggle, there's no progress. Those who profess to favour freedom yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without ploughing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. So this is a good quote for 
for all of us and especially for for Jim with his his uh, w work and all the struggles he's done so respect to him now if we look in publications hopefully we'll come up with the book right now this is the book that um Sharon said she's been to the uh, a couple of talks and a, a uh, about uh, including a couple of launches uh, it's the African and Caribbean people in Britain a history now it's great that there are now a number of publications there's the lovely work that um, is done on the um, Miriam Kaufman did on the Black Tudors and um, uh, references one of our early speakers um, talked about a book he'd written for children about um, African and Caribbean people in Britain and because it's one o'clock in the morning here I can't remember his name I apologize so it looks like this guy is really interesting so how's about inviting him to come along in um, yeah come along in uh, in the new year that would be really interesting wouldn't it so I'll, I'll keep that page and we'll um, We'll, we'll invite him. So presumably he's a good speaker then if he's been promoting his books, uh, Sharon. He's an excellent speaker. He, he, he's done so much with regards to African and Caribbean history, um, particularly in the UK, but just, just all round, he's just very good. Lovely. So um, you must, um, anybody who, who knows anybody who's good and I don't know Garrick whether there were speakers that you would feel from Bunmi's conference that we could invite as well because we can usually yes yes they are these yeah. people in it at some stage um yeah. but that's wonderful and and the other important thing we've talked about today is um oh right uh that she did today Oh, I'm losing my plot here because I'm trying to read the chat at the same time as talking, which isn't a good idea. All right, then. So, right. Back to the uh, the plot then. On the chat, Richard says that you did do an interview with Bunny. I'd forgotten. It was two years ago. We have been talking a long time on the Benin Bronzes and it's on, on YouTube. So it's fantastic. So it's really good that we're able to to share all these stories. So I've got lots of, I've got a number of themes that we've been looking at, including museums. So Richard and Christine, I'll be really interested to hear about perhaps some of the museums and archives in South, um, I'm sure we'd all be interested in South Africa. Um, the um, new museum in Cairo um, is coming along. Um, a, think it's at least another year before that opens. The new museum in Benin um, in Nigeria, that's uh, that's now, I'm not sure if it's open yet, I don't think it's quite open yet, but we need to follow up on, on these things. Also understanding in Britain what museums are doing in terms of decolonializing their, um, so that's the right way of saying it, their um, collections and identifying things and I've carried on watching when I've been able to what the British stole which is this this program that's on in the in Australia at the moment which is fascinating talking about all sorts of different uh, um, different stories and and taking us I think last week's was the one I was telling you about about the um, North American Indian um, clothes that uh, that have now been returned so uh, and here in Australia all the time we've got stories going on there's a really proactive movement now to um, give the voice of the first get the voice of the first Australian people into our government and and into recognition so there's a lot of stories that I, I see on the television about return of um, items to their uh, appropriate places, to their appropriate groups, and to respect and recognise the uh, the history of the thousands of years of history of the first Australians. And it's interesting. I've only really recently thought through the whole uh, whole issue of um, settler societies, which I think you mentioned, Richard, and Canada. 
the US, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa are really the big, I think the big settler societies, I don't think I've omitted anywhere, have I? Um, and I think there's a very different way that history went in those societies to other places. So yeah, we just carry on and we'll see what we can, can cover in forthcoming weeks. So I'm just going to ask um, finally, Avril, if you had anything that you wanted to add while you're, you've joined us, because we didn't join you to begin with, and I know you do your walks and talks. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just really interesting to hear about South Africa, because obviously it's not a place we think about too much, even though it is part of Africa. Most people talk about West Africa. Um, so it's interesting to hear what Richard had to say. Um, I don't really have any comment other than just listening to what everyone else is saying and just really finding it really interesting. But thank you very much. Well, that's wonderful. So Avril and others, on that note, um, is there anything else anybody wants to wrap up with? Richard, you've just come back on again, so. No, just because Sam's still here and say thank you. I appreciate the comments. And yeah, we got music in the background, so I'll, I'll mute. Okay, thank you very much then. Okay, well, thank you very much to all of you. What we'll do now is that we'll switch the recording off. Thank you very much indeed, Simon.